Well, hi, and welcome back to another edition of the Pastors Podcast. I am Bob, joined here with Matt and Todd. Uh, we are continuing our series, our sub-series of a series, talking about the um, sins of the tongue, how we speak. And uh, today, we are going to talk about uh, swearing or cursing. Uh, not necessarily cursing as in I'm placing a curse over you, though biblically speaking, it would actually fall into that same category. I have to assume not too many people watching or running around placing curses on people. Hopefully. Hopefully. Um, but I suppose if you say, I wish you would die, that's kind of a kind of a curse in and of itself, maybe modern day curse. In any event. Maybe we'll do a sub, sub, sub series on it. Uh, on modern day curses. <laughs> Uh, so we do want to talk about swearing, though. Uh, before we get into like defining it and all of that, um, the good question to ask is why? Like why? You know, this is a a subset of abusive speech, so swearing would fall under abusive speech because the majority of time our swearing is at something, and I would is at at a person. I would say all of the time it's at something. Sometimes it's an inanimate object, but so we're always swearing at something or because of something. So we would say that's abusive speech, like to swear at somebody. Um, but uh, why else? Why else would you say, hey, this is such an important topic that we need to kind of single it out to, to talk about it? Well, I think, uh, you know, as we've gone through a lot of these other sins of the tongue, I think generally speaking, the, the world would also see those as damaging, as abusive. But this is perhaps the one that is most culturally accepted. Uh, I mean, you just see it laced throughout, you know, TV, movies, you can just see the, the guidelines being kind of stripped back. Um, it's, it's probably hard to go anywhere in a public place without hearing that kind of language going back and forth. And uh, generally, it's, it's fairly accepted by the world. This is just standard vocabulary now. Um, so now thinking in the life of a believer, as we're living in the world but not seeking to be of the world, these are things that we face daily in, in whatever context we're living in. Yeah, I would just add to that, Matt. I look at Second Timothy chapter three, talking about what it's going to be like in the last days, and it says, "Here's the list: lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers." It's in the list there, and then he goes on to talk about those without self-control, treacherous, reckless. Uh, that that's a list I think that encapsulates this sin of swearing, cursing at others, using language or speech that's very worldly. Uh, and I just think it's something that, as you said, we can fall so prey to it. It's just culturally acceptable. Our society thinks no issue of it. We go to school, we go to work, we live in the world, and we hear this kind of speech all over the place. And uh, I think sometimes as believers, we can just fall into that without really thinking much about it. And yet, mm -hmm. As we're talking about here, we realize, wait, no, God wants to sanctify every part of us, including even those areas that are culturally acceptable. So I do think it's important for us to address this topic. Yeah, even uh, even churches, right? So we know a while back, Mark Driscoll swore from the pulpit. Many times. Many times. And, and he, uh, he had said it's because of the massive amount of stress that he was under um, that, uh, that he was swearing from here. And, and I'll just say, too, a while back... You know, I sat down and watched a bunch of the services just here in the Grand Rapids area, and I can tell you that uh, the majority, not all, but the majority of the people who were teaching um, or saying announcements or something like that, they were much looser with their words that they were using where you could have that double entendre, right, where you know it means something, but you use it another way, so it's funny. And, um, and just having that coming out, um, from the pulpit, it, whatever happens in the pulpit, it's going to be amplified that much more, you know, in the congregation. And so being very wary mm -hmm. of, um, you know, those people and listening to those people, I think we have to be very, very careful. I think Driscoll really desensitized the evangelical culture in many ways to this sin, you know, where he, he, I think you're right, I think it was stress, but I think also there was an ulterior motive there. I think he thought you know, you can't really effectively speak to this generation unless you're using their language. Right. So it's a very pragmatic thing on his part. Listen, if we're going to win people in Seattle to the Lord, 
it's a very grunge culture up here. So listen, if I'm going to be able to speak truth in these people's life, I got to get down there with them. I got to right. cuss and swear. And that's the classic pragmatist model, right? Let's right. just adopt our methods to win the culture. And it's not cool to be uh, having speech that's, you know, clean and pure. It's cool to be uh, vulgar. It's cr cool to be crude. So if we're going to win people with the Lord, we got to be like that. That's, I think, what was driving him in many yeah. cases. And so you had many Christians looking at that saying, well, listen, you've got a guy that's a well-known pastor. He's, you know, pastor of a mega church in Seattle. They've got, what, eight campuses or whatever, and he's doing it. So why can't we? And I think it's really had a, a negative effect upon uh, the church in many ways where we just are, have grown desensitized to the issue. Yeah, because generally what do you see? The liberty in the pulpit is licensed for the sheep. Right. So they're going to just see those things and you know, they're essentially going to take them to this, their furthest end. Um, so it's, it's you know, like shepherd, like sheep. And you're seeing someone who's essentially going the way of Romans 12, where it says do not be conformed to the world. Right. And what was he doing? He was seeking out the things of the world, perhaps in an effort to bring them to Christ, but it was it was wrong methods. He was yeah. using, uh, you know, doing God's business man's way rather than God's way. That's good. So let's define it then. <clears throat> let's define, uh, you know, what what cursing is, what what swearing is. So if somebody says, "Hey, uh, what constitutes me swearing?" How do you how do you define that for him? Yeah, you know, it's uh, what we would think of as profanity, profane speech, uh, things that are offensive, taboo things, getting into the realms of sexually immoral, um, you know, those double entendre that you were talking about, and taking the Lord's name in vain, um, you know, or anything where we're uh, essentially wishing harm on someone else through our speech. So it's a pretty broad, broad category, but I'd say those are a few things that fall into it. Yeah, it's coarse speech. Yeah. It's inappropriate speech. It's... It's language that adopts the, the um, cultural norms. And so our culture, in a sense, kind of defines what these terms are, right. Mm -hmm. right? So it's not like these words in and of themselves are inherently wicked. It's that our culture has assigned um, profanity or a, a meaning to these words. And so they're what come out of people's mouth in our culture when they're angry or frustrated or mm -hmm. disgusted or whatever. And it's, so it's culturally determined words that then become used in coarse settings. And I think that's that's what we're talking about. Yeah, and I think it's important to note, like, it's it's culturally. So if you ever go to a different culture, which would be like a different country, essentially, and, and uh, you'll find, like, they may use words that we consider swear words, but they use them normally. And the the opposite is true as well. I've been in situations where I've used words that we use normally only to find other people deeply offended by the words coming out of my mouth. You so learn the hard way. You do learn the hard way. So <laughs> it is important. So so with that being said, it also means you can't you can't say, well, this culture says it's okay to say these words. So in my own culture, I'm going to use those because that's well, no, you live in this culture, right. and so you're adopting those same norms. Uh, so what does the Bible say? The Bible has a lot to say. Um, first of all, I think we all know the Ten Commandments, especially Exodus 27, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. And so, um, you know, we, we oftentimes equate, you know, taking the Lord's name in vain as like the chief swear, right? Because that, that is really, we could say, going against God, against who he is, against his nature, and we're using his name as something common, and even worse, we're, we're profaning it. So, we're taking it down lower than our own level, and we're using that name to his name to describe something. So, first and foremost, chiefly amongst all swearing, regardless of the culture, I would say this this supersedes any culture, mm -hmm. is to use God's name in vain. Yeah, because what I mean, what is vain? It's it's useless. It's empty. It's there's it's hollow. There's it's a throwaway word, and you're using the very name of the Lord uh, in a useless throwaway manner where no we're called right. to revere the name of the Lord. He is to be praised and worshipped and honored according to what he prescribed in Scripture. And then we're taking that to the complete opposite extreme and essentially just, just tossing it through the mud. Right. You'd say the same thing about Christ's name. So mm -hmm. obviously we're talking about all of that together. Yeah. Right. So it's it's language referring to the Godhead in a way that is is so dismissive of his holiness. It's a vulgar use of the term. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously no believer should ever be guilty of any 
thing that closely approximates taking the name of the Lord in vain. Right. Uh, also, James 3.8, uh, talking about taming the tongue. He says, with it we bless our Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. He says, my brethren, these things ought not to be this way. So I like how James attaches this to have been made in the likeness of God. So he says you're cursing men, and now it's not just, hey, this is coming out of you, so it's sinful, but he's saying the thing you're directing it at, that's God's image. Mm. And so you're marring the image of God, not only in yourself now, because you're you're swearing, but now you're marring it in somebody else. So we can see here when you're swearing, it's it's a community sin, if you will, right? So now you're 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 taking what you're you're taking your words and you're that's why we'd say it's verbal abuse, right? You're abusing that other person. And James actually says you're abusing the image of God in them. Mm. Uh, and then he, he talks about uh, 2 Timothy, Paul talks about 2 Timothy 2.16, and he says, avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness. So what is he talking about there? What's worldly and em empty chatter? Yeah, again, it's the, that idea of vain. You know, it's, the, that word vain has that, that kind of meaning, is empty, is useless, is, is hollow, is there's, there's no real substance to it. And in fact, in this context, you're, you're taking something and you're you're bringing it even lower you, you know we've said this before but then what is it characterized by it's it's worldly it's it's part of the the worldly system ideology mm -hmm. of living so you now as someone who has been removed from that called to be in the world but not of the world now you're you're diving into how the world is living how the world is acting how the world is talking these things should not even characterize you in fact you know, another text is Ephesians 5, where in verse 3 it says, But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you, as is proper among saints. And then verse 4, talking specifically of our, our speech, he says, Then there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So he just comes off of chapter 4 and saying, you know, no longer be like the Gentiles who are acting in the darkness of their heart and all of these things. You're to be putting on the new self and the likeness of Christ and the righteousness of the truth. Mm. And these are the things that should be characterizing you. Don't don't be going back to what you used to be, but now pursue righteousness and godliness. Yeah, and what you're saying there, Matt, is so good. I think of James 4, 4. James says, Do not do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility with God. Mm -hmm. There's no middle ground here. Either you are for God or you're against God. You, yeah. If you want to saddle up to the world and you want to be like the world, then you're actually making yourself, he goes on to say, an enemy of God. Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So I think this is one of the ways that we as believers can potentially fall into worldly ways, worldly thinking, is we just want to be thought of as cool by the culture. Right. We want to be accepted by the culture. We, you know, have our kids in school sometimes where it's so rampant or workplaces where it's so rampant. We want to fit in. And so TV shows, movies, TV, movies, internets. I mean, it's all over. It's so rampant that we as believers can get sucked into that because we don't want to be hated by the world. And so we try to become like the world. And yet James says, in reality, we're actually becoming an enemy of God when we do that. Right. Very serious. And when you do it, see what uh, Paul also tells Timothy here, for it will lead to further ungodliness. So if you're trying, as you say, to blend in with the world and you don't want your coworkers or your friends or whoever that is to think, oh, you're such a square, right? Um, then you're going to keep going. There's not going to be an end because the, the dirty joke, the swear word that you say, all those kind of things, you say, oh, it's just kind of a one-stop thing. Well, no, the world's going to be like, oh, well, he's with us. Mm. He's not standing up for this other stuff that he said he believed. And so what's going to happen? You're going to, that train's on the tracks, right? It's going to keep going down the tracks because you just get a little more, a little more. And the next thing you know, you're not just partaking and listening to those mm. jokes. You're actually mm. telling those jokes. You're bringing it from your job or whatever it is and telling other people those jokes. So a little bit of ungodliness cannot sustain. It's going to grow into a lot of godliness. And that's what Paul's warning Timothy yeah. here. Yeah, I think of just, you know, you... You hear that, you hear a swear word, some kind of profane or dirty joke, and you kind of wince at it at first. And then the next time you hear it, you're like, you wince maybe a little bit less. It's still uncomfortable, but then you're, you keep on taking that in. And what's happening is it's, you're developing a callus over your heart, and you're not removing yourself from that and pursuing godly things. 
And then, you know, I think of uh, 1 Timothy 4, where it talks about men who have seared, or, or, yeah, because uh, by means of the hypocrisy of liars, seared in their own conscience with a branding iron, is that, that you're unfeeling toward it, where, yeah, as uh, it says, says in 2 Timothy 2, it's going to lead to further ungodliness because you're no longer sensitive to these things. Right. You're no longer saying, oh, this is not something I should be doing. You're just so, so commonplace now in your life that this is just the norm mm. now for you. Yeah, you've set your affections on men instead mm. of on God. Yeah. So what about substitute words? What about words that, you know, our culture is very good. Like we said, there's a reason why there are so many different sins of the tongue where it doesn't just say, hey, don't let anything bad come out of your mouth, right? We've talked about things like uh, lying and, and we've talked about abusive speech and we talked about swearing and we talked about slandering, right? And also more even. And so what if we substitute a word? Like we've got a million four-letter substitutes for the very few four-letter swear words out there, right? So if somebody comes to you and says, hey, I'm not swearing, but mm -hmm. I, I've got the substitutes covered. Is that okay? What do you? How do you counsel them? I ask you why. Why are you using this? What's <laughs> uh, we we've, we've talked about this. He says, but Matt, thing. I'm not swearing, right? You got your high school kids, right? And they're yeah. like, hey, my friends are swearing. I'm mm -hmm. not using those same words. I use substitute words. It sounds like something high school kids <laughs> would say. So <laughs> I use substitute words for those. Is that still sin? What do you say, youth uh, pastor Matt? You know, what's what's in your heart? What's the purpose of you using those? Is it you want to swear, but you're wanting to put on that Christian front so you, you appear good to all of your good Christian friends and your youth pastor doesn't come and lecture you on, <laughs> <laughs> on all of these things? You know, what's the purpose behind it? What's the heart behind it? Are you secretly wanting to tiptoe the line between worldliness and godliness mm. um, I think just, that's, just to that's kind of helpful. keep up the front. Um, that's a good then, way to put it. Yeah, then like you said, you're really making yourself out to be an enemy of God. It's well said. Yeah, yeah. So I think we should, uh, there's no such thing as a clean word for these sinful ones because as you rightly said, it's in our heart. So why would you even want to? You know, that's the wrong question to ask, right? Like, how close can I get to sin and still be a Christian, <laughs> yeah, that's right? The question that's you're just asking. the wrong what question. What words can I say? Yeah, <laughs> and still get away with and it. And still get away with it. So yeah, no, it's very good. So that would fall underneath behavior modification in order yeah. to look apart, and we don't want to do that. Um, so why is this such a heinous sin? You know, we we uh, we asked this question about each of them. You know, why should we care so much about this? Um, so somebody says, look. It's just a swear word. Once in a while, I'm by myself. I'm working on my car. I'm working on my house. I jam my finger, whatever that is. Nobody's even around. Why does it even matter if I'm driving down the road in my car and somebody cuts me off? I don't want to get too specific, but you know, say you're driving down the road. Hmm. Why? <laughs> Seems like this one might be hitting kind of close to home. We'll leave huh? driving alone. So say you're working on your car and you break your knuckles, right? So what? Why does it matter if nobody's even there? What's the big deal, right? Well. Matthew 12 says that we're going to be held accountable for every single word that comes out of our mouth. Hmm. That's why it matters. Mm -hmm. Who cares if nobody's around? It doesn't really matter if you got an audience or not. It doesn't matter if one person hears you or a thousand people hear you or nobody hears hmm. you. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how big the audience is that's listening because there's an audience of one who matters more than anything else. Who's always listening. Is always listening. So you can't escape him. So, yeah, you might be able to swear in your garage and no one hears you, but there's a God in heaven who does, mm -hmm. and he knows your heart, and he knows that in that moment your heart is expressing bitterness and anger or frustration or there's, there's sin coming out in that moment. Mm. Right? A lack of trust in Him, a lack of submission to His will for your life. I mean, a lack of love for people if it's directed towards someone. I mean, all of that is going on in that moment. And so it's not just a neutral occasion that you can just kind of say, well, it's no big deal because it didn't hurt anybody. That, that's the wrong question again. Right. The question always mm -hmm. is, how do I please the Lord? Mm -hmm. How do I honor my Savior? How do I live in a way that pleases Him in all respects of my life, even when nobody's looking? So that's why it matters. I would say especially when nobody's especially looking. Especially when nobody's yeah. looking. Yeah, because yeah. that's really your true self, right? You're, mm -hmm. yeah. When nobody's there to hold you accountable, when nobody's there to say, hey, what did you say or something like that, like what's coming out at that moment right there is really who you are. Yeah, I think, you know, what, what's, what's the last fruit of the Spirit? Self-control. If you can't even control the words that are coming out of your mouth, I mean... Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10 to be taking every thought captive. I mean, every single part of us is to be used for the to the obedience of the Lord. Um, and, you know, whether we eat, drink, whatever we do, all to the glory of God. So it's 
even in, like you said, especially in those moments where no one sees us because that's likely who we truly are. Yeah, I think back to um, the verse you quoted, First Timothy, talking about how it's going to be in the, the latter days and men lacking self-control. When we think of self-control, I think most people default to sex or alcohol, right? That's kind of <laughs> people's natural default. But self-control is a self, so that actually encompasses your whole self, mm. right? Your entire being lacking control. And so these words coming out of your mouth, which you just said, and, and I absolutely agree with, is the words coming out of our mouth are going to show how much self-control we actually have. Mm. So if you're swearing, it's showing you have a complete lack of self-control mm. and you're an emotionally driven individual. Um, you know, when I remember in school, our teacher would always say, if all you can do is swear, it shows a lack of vocabulary, right? And basically saying you're stupid if all you can do is swear. Uh, she was a great, great teacher. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and while that may be true, it, it even more so shows that, you know, you, you don't have that under control. And as you said, God expects us to glorify him with everything we do. Like Paul doesn't say glorify God nine to five, glorify God when you're around people. He says in all that you do glorify him. And if we're supposed to be doing things like praying without ceasing and we're supposed to be, you know, our mouths full of thanksgiving, you know, then we have to ask, well, if these swear words are coming out, why am I not praying without ceasing? Why am I not giving thanks? What's actually going on in my heart? So once again, this isn't a root issue, the swearing that's coming out. This is a fruit of something that's yeah. taking place yeah. inside. And that's what makes it really heinous sin because that's the fire alarm, the smoke alarm going off in your house. Are you just going to sit there and let the house burn down around you as you eat your microwave meal? Or are you going to get up for a minute, hit pause on the basketball game, and figure out what's actually going on, really? Hmm. Yeah, and I think, too, uh, we had talked about the, kind of the world sees this as the, the natural pain reliever, right? Is what psychology would say that, yeah. hey, if, you, if you're... If you're swearing, that's that's just a way to kind of let the steam out, so something worse doesn't act or something bad doesn't actually happen. They might not even say that that's bad, right? Whereas, you know, I I think of Philippians four and verse eight and nine. It says, "Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things." And then verse nine, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Mm -hmm. So rather than just letting the anger fly and letting the steam come out? Are we going to the Lord? Are we trusting in Him that if we dwell on these things, if we cast our anxieties on Him, we're going to receive peace? Yeah, because you're actually not dealing with the sin. No. That's the problem. Yeah. So psychology is like, just get it out. Mm -hmm. what, what the Bible is saying is, no, deal with what's going on in your heart. Don't just yeah. get it out, so right. to speak. I think related to this, and you mentioned it earlier, Bob, when you swear at somebody, that person is made in God's image. Mm. They're an image bearer. They're a, they're a child of God in the sense that they're made in His image. They may not be saved, but they're still a, a human being, and God gives great dignity to human beings who are made in His image. And so when we direct cursing words or uh, inappropriate words or sexually charged words, how, whatever there is there, it's directed at someone who is made in the image of God. And so it has no place in our life as believers. It's not edifying to that person. It's not mm. glorifying to God. It doesn't build that person up. It, it does nothing like that. And so uh, that's another reason why it's so heinous. Yeah, that's yeah, good. I think, too, just back to that illustration, you used it a couple of weeks ago, of the, the nails in the wood, and you, you can take the nails out, but those holes are still there. So as we're cursing, as we're, you know, this coarse language is coming upon other people, that's damaging. It is. Um, yeah, it's, it has lasting effects. Exactly. So then how do we combat this? So really, um, I just put down three things that uh, why Christians swear. We can talk about each of these. But first of all, you may not know any better. There's a lot of people that just grow up, maybe they're recently saved. They just grow up in a household where swearing is normal, um, very common, right? Watch movies or TV shows, and they're around other people. And so, you know, when, when I was in the military, swearing was second nature, right? Like, it just was all the time. And so maybe you just don't know better. Fair enough. Second second thing may be you may know better, but you're just immature in your faith. So somebody who actually knows they're not supposed to, but when they swear, they still get that that kind of, uh, you know, their, their guilty feeling, of guilty of that sin that comes upon them, and they're starting to realize it, and they're trying to kick the habit, so to speak, but they're just really struggling. And then you have the third person who's like, hey, 
this is a culturally normative, you know, uh, those antiquated swear words as you call them. It's not a big deal anymore. You could stand up in the middle of a restaurant and say all the big swear words and nobody even cares. So why should I mm -hmm. even care, right? So it's kind of the three areas as we little as we parse that out a little bit. So what do you guys have to say? How, how would you kind of assess that? And then what kind of uh, uh, advice would you give uh, for somebody to, to grow in those areas? So, oh, well, I was going to say, I mean, really, really for any of the scenarios, what do they need to know? They need to know what God's word says on how to, to be living as a believer. They need to go to, you know, those passages we talked about, Ephesians 5, you know, First uh, Timothy, James 3, and just understand, you know, what is the power of our speech? What is it really indicative of? And then what are we to be, well, one, putting off, then go into the scripture to renew our minds, and then what are we putting on its place? So, whereas, you know, per, perhaps they're at different levels of spiritual maturity, the Thankfully, the answer is all the same. Uh, sure. um, is just going back to God's Word. Yeah, and you may have some people that are more prone to this than others for whatever mm -hmm. reasons. The way they were raised, you know, back, background, uh, certain influences in their life. You may have people that are more bent this way. And so they come to Christ and that bent is still there. But as you said, the, the solution is still the same, right? Mm -hmm. It's holiness. It's, Lord, sanctify me to the uttermost including my speech. So it doesn't matter really what causes a person to use language that curses and, and those kinds of things. At, at the end of the day, it's what does God say and how do I put off speech that is culturally driven and put on speech that honors Christ and serves others. It's just a matter of sanctification. So in that sense, it's not hard. Right. I mean, it's, it's, it's not complicated. Sometimes it's hard. Sanctification right. is hard because right. we don't like to give up our sin, but it's not complicated. It's, right. it's take off the vice of swearing and put on the vice of edifying speech by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I think secondarily, I mean, we, we've said it over and over and over again. This is, this is a worldly patterns, worldly ideologies. So really just asking, what are you taking in? Yeah. What are you allowing to come in? What are the TV shows? What are the movies that you're that you're watching? What are your friends like? Are they those that kind of accept and promote these things? Because you know, I think of, you know, again, Proverbs four twenty three, mm. guard your heart guard with all diligence, heart. because from it flow the springs of life. And then you think of kind of the antithesis to worldly worldly and empty chatter. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ yeah. richly dwell within you. So what are you taking in? Because what you take in, we're, I mean, we're kind of like a garbage in, garbage out kind of thing. Whatever yeah. you're putting in is going to be coming out of you. Um, so it's asking. And the fruit of that questions. is speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Yeah, exactly. So that's the evidence yeah. that the truth of God is bearing fruit in our heart. Yeah. Yeah, you guys don't let me sing to you, though. So I try. There's a reason for that. <laughs> Joyful noise. <laughs> Joyful noise. Amen. <laughs> Well, I hope this was helpful for you, and uh, we certainly pray that it is and uh, that we can all just strive for sanctification, especially in, in areas of speech. So um, I hope you guys have a good rest of the day, and we will see you later.